I will go ahead and get started with introductions. If you have already um, participated in the previous two nights of this webinar, I'm going to cover some of the same things at the beginning, so I apologize about that. But um, I know we have a few new people here tonight. So just with that, um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's third and final night of the Direct-to-Consumer Beef Webinar Series. Um, we created this webinar series because as an organization, um, we had a ton of new inquiries of, of farmers interested in finishing their beef um, since COVID-19. It was a trend before that, but it's really accelerated um, with the meat shortages that we've experienced the last couple months in, in the grocery stores. Um, and so tonight our focus will be on selling beef, but if you would like to learn more about production, processing, or business planning, and were unable to attend the previous two nights, we, um, we're gonna have those recordings sent to everyone's inbox who registered to, for the webinar, and we hope to do that tomorrow. My name is Olivia Vogel, and I'm the Local Food Project Coordinator for the Kentucky Center for Agriculture and Rural Development, and I would like to introduce my colleague, uh, Spencer. Hey, good evening, everyone. As Olivia said, my name is Spencer Gwynn, and I've been a business development specialist with Kentucky Center for Ag and Rural Development, or KCARD, uh, for a little over three years now. So looking forward to tonight. Thanks, Spencer. Can I just tell you a little bit about KCARD real quick? I won't spend too much time on it, but um, we are a nonprofit organization that was established in 2001 to facilitate agricultural and rural business development in Kentucky. I've got on the screen there what we do and how we serve. Um, we provide educational opportunities, one-on-one -on -one technical assistance, and business support services to new and existing agribusinesses across the state of Kentucky. Um, KCARD has also launched the Kentucky Local Food System Expansion Initiative to expand local food purchasing in Kentucky, and that's a project that I primarily work on. We'll be discussing this uh, briefly at the end of the webinar tonight, but if you'd like to learn more about that or KCARD's other services, please check out our website. We've got lots of information on there. So just before we get started, a, a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate tonight. Um, we have disabled the chat function and we are accepting all questions through the Q&A um, function at the bottom of your screen. Spencer will be monitoring that and we will um, prioritize the attendees' questions tonight, so please feel free to submit them in there. Um, as time allows, presenters will address as many questions as they can at the end of their presentation, but we will do our best to stay on track with time tonight and keep it to one hour and 15 minutes. Um, we will be recording the webinar, like I said, and sharing it with you at the end of the week. And um, if you leave the webinar series with unanswered questions, please reach out. Um, we would love to help. So with that, we're going to get into the agenda tonight, and our partners um, just, we have a, a stellar agenda tonight, so I'm really excited about that. Um, tonight we are presenting in partnership with Allison Smith and Caitlin Hawkins of the Kentucky Beef Council and Cattlemen's, Kentucky Cattlemen's Association, Carolyn Gaughan, the Senior Manager with Aramark Supply Chain and Procurement um, at UK, um, Chef Wita Michael of the Wita Michael Family of Restaurants, Chad Smith, the Director of Promotion and Development at the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, Office of Ag Marketing. Um, so there we go. And lastly, um, just a brief introduction to the audience tonight. So about 50% of you have been raising cattle for more than 10 years, and 20% of you have been raising cattle for five to 10 years, but only 39% of you currently process and sell finished beef. Um, but we, uh, have you on on the call here tonight so that tells us that um, there's some experienced cattle farmers who are really interested in processing and selling their finished beef um, all right so with that I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Allison who is gonna um, talk about some consumer preferences
Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, had a little problems with the mute button there. Um, I'm Allison Smith with the Kentucky Youth Council, and uh, Caitlin Hawkins is also on with us today. We both work on behalf of the 38,000 beef farmers across the state of Kentucky. And so, uh, Olivia, we thank you and Spencer for coordinating this project. Um, it's been wonderful to hear over the last two days, and I know it's going to be a great group of people tonight. So we're excited to get started and share some information about um, consumer preferences and trends is what we're going to share with you today. And um, just to kind of remind everyone that we do represent the beef checkoff and the beef checkoff is um, a dollar per head that is goes towards promotion research and education. And that uh, that dollar is a federal dollar, but then we also have a state dollar that does the exact same thing. Um, the, the state dollar is a, a refund, refundable dollar that you can ask for back if you choose to. But those two dollars really go to do all these things that you see on your uh, screen right now. We work on behalf of the beef farmers with the folks who are selling our product from the restaurants to the retailers. Um, and even looking at consumers and their preferences. So that's what we're going to present tonight. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Caitlin Hawkins to, to start us off. Thanks, Allison. Um, so as Allison mentioned, we do work on behalf of the Kentucky Beef Council. And with that in mind, tonight we're gonna to really talk and dive into some of the research that has come through that beef checkoff program, both nationally and on the state level with the funds that come from you as cattle producers. Uh, we'll cover some consumer demand and consumption, marketing claims, really what's driving those purchasing factors when it comes to consumers, trends that we see, and then Allison at the end has some really great resource opportunities that we're very excited to share with all of you that we really hope by the end of tonight, you reach out for whether you're starting your direct-to-consumer business or you've been in business for a number of years. So we'll dive right into consumer demand. Um, as we see here within this resource, we show that wholesale beef demand has remained strong. Um, it's grown throughout the years, specifically since 2015, as we'll see in a few slides. But in 2019, we really hit a phenomenal year for beef demand on a U.S. wholesale level. And really what we're seeing in 2020, even despite the COVID-19 outbreak and some disruptors to the supply chain, demand is very strong and will continue to trend up for the rest of this year. One of the questions that we oftentimes get a lot, especially when it comes to people that are looking to start a direct to consumer business, but also just looking at statistics that we have that beef consumption per capita does continue to trend upwards. Like I said in our last slide, when you see and you look at 2015 to current, we're really seeing a positive projection there. And one of the things that we talked about when we went through these slides as staff is the fact that when you note and you see 2020, you see that we went from 58. Um, pounds per capita in 2019 to 57 in 2020. However, that one percentage point really does not make it any statistically difference on a downward trend, but we're still seeing the fact that consumer demand and consumption for beef is high across the board. Another thing that we're continuing to see trends is the fact that people are willing to pay for beef. They recognize, and we'll see in a few slides, the benefits that come from beef, and they're willing to invest their dollars year over year into this phenomenal protein to really provide a great eating experience, not only for their household, but when they entertain others, and when they're making suggestions to their friends about what products worked well for them and what they look forward to buying in the future. One of the questions that get asked on the consumer beef index, which we'll touch on in a minute, but in a lot of the market research that's done around beef and buying trends is how often are you consuming and purchasing beef? So when the market research team looked at this on a monthly total level and really asked people, how often are you consuming beef at least weekly? We see that here throughout from January of 2019 to May of 2020, you see the fact that people are consuming beef 
pretty regularly. We see that seasonality wise, you can obviously look and assume that that would come and go throughout the year with summer grilling season, holiday roasting season, things like that as we see the popularity grow, but we still are seeing the fact that it's a regular protein throughout the households across the nation. And when we dive deeper into some Kentucky data as well that we've seen, it holds true even here in our state. The number of times that people are eating beef um, at least consumed in the last week is also a good trend as well and holds pretty steady. So we see frequent opportunities to put beef at the center of the table, at the center of many celebrations, and also keep people rallied around the protein and providing new opportunities for them to use it for their families. A lot of the questions come around marketing claims. So as was presented last night and even on the first night of the webinar, it's all about how you're choosing to tell your story because that's what's gonna set you apart from others. When we asked and looked at through the consumer beef tracker, which polls 500 people per month, we see that when looking at claims that were purchased in the past month, the majority of claims that have been purchased in those households were based off of quality grade. So we see USDA Choice and USDA Prime some people do not necessarily look at claims, but as one would expect, we see closely behind that your grass-fed claims, those antibiotics, naturally raised claims are still holding strong there too, which is really instrumental to really looking at how to set yourself apart and tell your story and your part of the beef industry when marketing your beef. One of the questions that we get a lot of times at the Kentucky Beef Council is the difference between conventional or grain finished beef versus grass fed beef. When we see here at retail, the bulk majority or, or large percentage, 98% to be specific, of the beef sold at the retail level is conventional or grain finished beef. And then you see that there are still um, some of those products on the market there at the retail level that do that grass fed claim as well. Another question we get a lot of times, and one of the things that is really interesting when you look at the retail clay case are the products out there that are sold at retail without claims versus the ones that do have claims associated with them. So you can see here that 96% of those do not have claims. But one interesting thing that I'm sure we'll get into a little bit later as we look at other products, and that you guys have heard from each other this week, is that more and more products are putting claims on them because consumers want to hear the story and they want to see what options are out there. When we dive into the marketing claims and looking at really what claims are being sold at retail level, no antibiotics is a large percentage of that, quickly followed by organic. And then we do see some products that do have other claims such as naturally raised, um, they can have a claim on there as far as is there additives, things like that. A large driving factor in a lot of the business decisions that are made are really what are consumers wanting. One of the things that we know as a beef industry is that poultry is a close competitor of ours, but we do see here with these trends in the consumer beef tracker information that beef has a strong positive overall perception. We see that we do have 70% and we do have attributes to us as we'll get into a few slides that do make us competitive with poultry and give us a little bit of a competitive edge and some insights. When polled in the beef tracker and really understanding and looking at what consumers look at to drive their purchasing power, a lot of the things that we see come up most when you're comparing beef and chicken are the fact, does it fit my budget? So we see here that poultry does have competitive edge in the consumer mindset on budget, as well as a good value for your money. Another circled item here on our board would be it's a healthier choice. Through the beef checkoff and through market research, 
we've been able to highlight these areas and drive a lot of advertising and educational resources to consumers on this. So we have resources out there that show people how to fit beef into a more budget-friendly diet or budget-friendly opportunity. Get more bang for your buck out of some of those cuts, but also to helping them understand the healthfulness behind beef. The fact that it does provide you 25 grams of protein and there are a number of beef cuts out there that are marked as lean. And I believe my screen has frozen. There we are. I apologize for that. Consumers do have concerns around production and considerations when it does come to purchasing around production as well. Um, when it comes to this criteria, we see a lot of questions around lean protein, but also we see that poultry does have our edge on that as we noted in the slide before. But people do consider beef a wonderful opportunity for social gatherings as well to bring family together. Right now we're in the midst of summer grilling season and although COVID has prevented a lot of family gatherings and social interactions, we do still see that it is valued within the consumers. Sixty-eight percent of consumers polled plan to eat the same amount of beef going forward and we do see that 13 percent consider eating more and 13 do percent consider percent do consider eating less. Taste is king when it comes to beef. It is a large driver when it comes to people purchasing beef as well as choosing to consume more beef. We see that time and time again and it's a wonderful opportunity to share recipes, give some insight into your customers when they're asking you questions around that. We oftentimes see that beef can be utilized as a quick meal, especially when it comes to ground beef. Um, even the opportunities to provide meals that are 30 minutes or less and recipes to gear towards that. When it comes to reasons for eating less, we do see that people do have questions around more plant proteins and those options on the markets, but oftentimes too, price is a real consideration there as well as we have heard over and over. But it's a wonderful opportunity for people to share the fact that there are budget-friendly cuts. You as providers of local beef could do bundles to help them understand how to stretch those dollars further. And then also helping people understand looking at it at a price per pound or even on a serving size basis. When it comes to production perceptions, beef outperforms chicken. Um, we do see that people polled saw that production perceptions were positive when it comes to the beef practice, as opposed to poultry, with our 44% there. Um, some of the population does remain neutral on that, but I believe that this is a wonderful opportunity to share that farm family story and the fact that consumers want to hear that you do care about your family and care about your farming operation to be able to pass that down to the next generation and caring for your cattle is a top priority within that. Animal welfare does continue to be a concern when it comes for production practices. Um, part of what is being advertised within the national Beef Checkoff is a whole campaign around beef quality assurance and really putting that to the forefront of the consumer mindset and helping them educate and see more of all of the hard work and dedication that producers put into their cattle herds and the healthfulness of your production at home to provide them a top quality product to feed their families. In the midst of 2020 and even over the past few years, we do see a lot of alternatives or substitutes hitting the market across all animal proteins, but also more specifically being competitive in that beef share as well. Um, however, those animal substitutes and uh, beef substitutes hold a small market share when compared to the rest of the products that are offered. As you can see here across animal proteins, we still have 99% of that market share, whereas the beef industry against beef substitutes does hold that same statistic as well. 
Okay, thank you, Caitlin. And, and so I'm going to jump in and talk about the online research uh, or search trend, excuse me. Um, and this will help you as you are uh, preparing maybe to do a little bit of marketing, maybe on the web or in Facebook um, or whatever it may be. And so um, there's a lot of words on here, but one of the major things that you want to um, think about is looking at recipes. People in, in the opportunity to uh, search are searching for recipes. So quick and easy recipes, um, recipes that are nutritionally balanced. Maybe they have um, a gluten-free option or maybe it's something that uh, addresses a diabetes issue, something like that. But they're, they're searching for recipes and searching for in information about nutrition. The great thing about um, the beef checkoff is actually if you need that nutrition information, uh, we have a database that can take the cuts that you are serving and offer that um, information, that nutrition information that you can print out either on a label or on a poster, um, whatever it may be that you would want to have so that you can tout the nutritional benefits of beef because that's one thing that there's a lot of misinformation out about beef is that, that beef is, is good for um, a balanced diet. And so it's a great opportunity for you to tout that when you've got, when you're out uh, either talking to consumers at a farmer's market or maybe one-on-one -on -one or even on your website. The other thing that they're searching for is how's, how are cattle raised? Um, as Caitlin alluded to in the research that, uh, that folks are just wanting to be more connected as they're further and further removed from the farm. They, they just want to know how um, you're doing what you're doing. We know we, we know um, how we do it, but there's a lot of times that people just don't necessarily understand maybe some of the methods that we're doing or um, some, of the, uh, some of the reasons why we might choose a certain breed or, or something like that. Uh, so then, of course, as you go down into the uh, specific bullet points here, you can see meatloaf, um, especially as we are coming out of that, that COVID situation, um, there's a lot of comfort food that was out there. People were at home and they were learning how to uh, cook again. And so um, you can see meatloaf, uh, stuffed peppers, uh, especially during the holidays, you're gonna see people searching for the prime rib recipes, helping people to understand what is prime rib, that you don't need to put it in a crock pot or put it with water. Uh, so giving them helpful tips when they're looking for those recipes. Uh, also, corned beef recipes are really popular during the St. Patrick's Day season, um, if you offer those. But just in general, when you're thinking about providing information for your uh, consumers, whoever it may be, whether it's at the farmer's market, just uh, giving them that meal solution is what they're looking for. Uh, because they, they, they're making that dinner decision at 4.30 when they're on their way home from work, and um, they've got to feed you know, people, their kids, and they also have to get them to practice. Um, and I know that slowed down a little bit with COVID, but there's still, um, there's still that, that concern to want to provide a healthy meal um, that's not going to break the bank, but it's also going to make everybody happy at the end of the night. So, um, and then one of the other things that, that we lastly saw is that there's searches for how-tos. So going back to the basics. So if you again can provide that for your, um, for your customers, that's a great opportunity. Uh, they're going to see you as a great resource if you can just say, okay, I'm, I'm selling at the farmer's market or I'm selling off a farm and all my beef is frozen. So let me provide you with this helpful tip on how you can defrost it um, so that you don't have that overwarmed effect that happens when they defrost it in the microwave for too long. Um, helping them to understand that it needs to be in the refrigerator rather than out on the side of the counter so that, and, and so they can see that you care um, what happens to that beef after it leaves you and goes home with them. So uh, again, another way to connect with your, your customers uh, as you're thinking about marketing your beef. And then we're gonna just kind of show you what cuts are popular and, and then show you some resources that are available from the Kentucky Beef Council um, because of the beef checkoff. So just real quickly to put this up here, um, there's several things going on, but the, the biggest thing I want you to, to get out of here is that uh, that people are buying beef at the retail market. And, we, and we've talked about this a little bit already, um, but they, they may be willing um, to pay a little bit more because they know that beef is, is a great investment for their dollar. And so again, as Caitlin mentioned before, uh, with, those, with those cuts of beef, whether you put it in a bundle or whether you're putting it 
um, or selling it individually or as a half or a whole, if you can just show them how they can use those different cuts um, in maybe different ways or how they can get more than one meal out of those cuts uh, of beef, then that's going to help them uh, feel more comfortable when they get those get those bundles from you or get that that steak or roast from you. And this has got a lot of things going on here, but if we just focus in on the, the red line here, um, this is just showing you that even during COVID, um, we know that uh, a lot of uh, crazy things were going on with, with the grocery stores, but uh, the, the, the sales of, of beef still continued to hang on. And um, you can kind of see in the very beginning of it where it was a, a stock up of, of folks. They just really kind of went into those stores and loaded up. And so um, we're, we're seeing that, that now they're still coming back and, and buying beef, but, but a lot of people, the research has showed us has uh, two, three, maybe even four meals of beef in their freezer. So this is good news for, for you all if you're thinking about direct marketing your beef because you know that you can kind of put this together as like, hey, you can buy a whole animal or you can buy a half or you can buy a quarter and have that in your freezer so it's ready to go. Um, and, and you don't have to worry about maybe a challenge of finding it at the grocery store. And then uh, food service again, uh, we're going to, we're, we're lucky to have uh, Wita Michael on tonight. Uh, she's a great uh, supporter of local, of local uh, foods and, and beef. And um, we know that in the food service world, it's been challenging, but uh, in, in regard to beef at uh, the food service, if you're thinking about maybe trying to direct market to a restaurant, um, the good thing is, is there's a lot of interest in local beef. There's, uh, and people are willing to pay, um, pay at a restaurant for a local product. And again, it just shows, even though, um, unfortunately, that COVID caused restaurants to um, basically close their doors, uh, that, that it's, it's bouncing back in regard to beef at the restaurants. Um, so, so we're looking forward to uh, seeing it uh, continue to grow as we uh, see restaurants open back up or even continue to offer the curbside. Um, one thing is, is important to show is that, that beef can still be great going out the door in a, in a styrofoam box too. So the last thing we're gonna talk about before we show you some of our resources is um, what are the cuts? What maybe when you're thinking about what you wanna offer at, um, at market, at the market or offer on your, um, on your website, here are some cuts that we're, we are seeing as uh, the most popular. And if you look at this top 10 list, we're looking at the middle meats really um, that are gonna be your most popular. And you say, well, I've got a lot of ground beef. Well, ground beef, obviously, um, if you look back at the sales, the stuff that we've showed you, ground beef is still a very important part of the beef, uh, of beef in regard to what people utilize, uh, especially we saw over COVID that, that a lot of people were buying ground beef because you can use it in so many various ways. But if you're looking for specific cuts, you can see here the ribeye, the strip, the sirloin, the porterhouse t-bone, uh, the tenderloin, the flank steak. And, and that's one thing that I hear a lot of people say is they have a hard time finding even a skirt steak because it, it goes out the door with restaurants um, that do fajitas. Fry tip, if you've never heard of that cut of beef, it's a great cut of beef that's coming from back towards uh, the sirloin area, uh, very popular on the West Coast, but becoming more and more popular here uh, in the state. Um, and it's a great cut of beef that you can marinate and it feeds a lot of people. So with that, we wanna show you some resources real quickly and then hand it back over. Um, let's see here, should pull it up so you can see it. So we have here, um, uh, and we can send the links out uh, with Olivia's thing, but if you go to beefitswestfordinner.com on the retail side, um, we, we have a lot of opportunities here where you, um, and we, the reason we put it as retail is if you are retailing this, this to consumers, there's a great opportunity for you to tap into this. So there's some uh, great articles that are, are rotated through on a, on a monthly basis that kind of gives you some ideas on consumer merchandising. And, uh, and trying to figure out that, that shopper and what they're doing. So this gives you great insight maybe on how you wanna approach the consumer. We could talk all night maybe about their, about, uh, their buying habits, uh, but this is a great resource for you as well. 
Also, if you are building a website or you're looking for specific handouts, um, these tools of the trade are great information for you. One thing that I would encourage you to do is maybe to sign up for this wholesale pricing um, update that you see on the left side of your screen. And that just gives you um, the, tr the transfer prices um, for that week across the country. And so you can kind of see when you're trying to price your beef, maybe it gives you a general idea. Also our cut charts are something that are really popular. If you can see here, um, they are something you can get either uh, through us, through the Beef Council, but you can also get it through um, by just downloading it. And then there's also yield data that you can get as well. Um, if you're curious about what a cut should, what, what you should be getting out of your beef, there's information there that can help you out. And then there's also um, some more information you can get on a, a newsletter that is out there that is talks more about retail and wholesale. Uh, and again, then there's some more great articles. And, and then if you go to kybeef.com uh, on our website, you can go down to the bottom uh, where we have our site map here and go down to the file, down to our site map and down to our resources to the marketing portal. And on our marketing portal, we have a retail page that you can click on and you'll, you'll need to contact us for a login. But what you can do here is you can actually download information um, to put on your website. All you have to do is say, um, this is provided by the, by the Beef Checkoff Program, and it will um, bring this up for you. We'll see if it's loading. I know I'm at the end of my time. It is, uh, Allison, I'm not sure if this is the case for other people, but um, I have not been able to see the website. I've only seen the PowerPoint. Huh, okay, hang on. Thank you, Olivia. Let's try, let's, um, let's try this. There we go. You see it now? Um, no. <laughs> no? Hmm. Let me stop sharing and We will try to, well, we can share it later. I don't want to take up all the, let's see here, share screen here. How about that? Can you see it now? Still loading on my end. Yes, we can see it now. Yes. Yay! Okay. Sorry about that. Um, well, so there's two websites, and um, one is on beefandsweatsfordinner.com, the other is on kybeef.com, and again, this is our KY beef one, but basically you can download these handouts. Um, you can see here the beef cut charts that are available if you would like to hand that out to the person that's coming to the farm to pick up beef. Um, these are great resources because it has all the cuts on it, as well as how to cook it, which is a lot of questions that we get. There's recipes that you can download as well. There's also social media posts that you're allowed to use. Um, and again, this is all because of the beef checkoff that we're able to have this. So uh, I'm kind of moving, moving through this fast. Uh, uh, this is one, understanding quality grades, especially if you're trying to market on that, that's a great one. Or here's one on the choices of beef, uh, which is also a great resource. And then our sustainability, which is over here. There's always questions about that. So some great resources for you to utilize nutrition information here. Um, and again, you can get all that free from us if you choose to do that, or you can get it off of kybeef.com. So with that, I'm going to stop my sharing again, and I'm going to turn it back over to Ms. Olivia. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. And if you can just make me the host again. Sorry. There we go. Great, thank you. Um, see. The first thing I'm gonna do before, um, before we move into the next section of our presentation, which is a beef fire panel, I'm gonna launch a quick poll um, that I would love to see the attendees answer quickly, if you can. Just how do you sell your beef currently? If you sell your beef.
Great. So it looks like most of you have voted. I'll just give it a couple more seconds. That is really helpful just to know um, our audience tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share results with you all so that you can see the results. So direct to consumer is, um, is the most popular. And several of you that don't, don't share, um, don't sell beef yet. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. And um, if the panelists, I think I have you up first, Carolyn, um, if you just want to take um, five minutes to cover um, just a brief overview of how you currently um, use beef. Yes, thanks so much for having me. Thank you all. I appreciate the time tonight. Um, so my name is Carolyn Dawn. I am uh, with Aramark, uh, and I work for uh, supply chain for the company and also um, work directly with UK dining to source the local uh, food that's served in the dining halls. Um, if you want to jump to the next slide, thank you. So uh, UK is a state institution, the land grant university. Um, they're the part of the mission is to support the Kentucky ag economy and that's what you know what they're based on uh, since their their inception and so when Aramark took over the dining services five years ago it was our obligation to maintain that mission in supporting local Kentucky farmers and so um, you know when I think about this and about my role here, um, you know, I think of the food service portion of the food system and what our responsibility as big buyers are in that food system. And so um, all the way from the production side, which it would be the farmers, around to the consumption side, which would be the consumers, my goal is to alleviate minimize the risk that any one of those stakeholders within that system takes on. And so um, typically in, in the, our food system, the people that are prone to the most risk would be the farmers on the one side and the consumers on the other side. And we can see this in um, consumers, there's, there's, you know, for example, there's hunger in the community, but the, there's a surplus of food. And so that disconnect there puts, puts one end of the spectrum at risk. And so typically in food service um, buying, their menus are, are created with, you know, one particular cut of meat in mind. And so each meal period using UK as the example would use maybe 250 to 500 pounds of meat for that one one meal to serve. And so if I'm thinking about how to service best service the local economy, I need to consider what we are buying and how we're buying it. If you want to go to the next slide. Um, so you know this is I'm speaking to the choir here because I'm talking to farmers, but this is an example of where the risk is coming from for farmers. It's everything that's happening in our world and our country is, uh, you know, directly impacting the farmers in, in our system. And the next slide is another example of this. And I'm, I made this pre COVID, but COVID can easily be inserted here in place of this Fire. And so this slide looks a little crazy, but at the top we have how the how the beef gets from the farm to the end user um, grocery. We call it. It could be food service. It could be um, you know restaurants, whatever. But in between, there's a lot of steps. And so um, you know when we're when the food system is operating with no kinks, no problems it is very efficient and it's it's incredible how much um you know every piece of that food system can be successful but when there is an issue that comes in that puts a kind of a wrench in it um it kind of messes things up so in 
last August, this is my example, is, is uh, one of the Tyson plants burned down, which was 5% of the U.S. beef production. Um, and so insert COVID, insert, you know, another disaster here. Um, but it means that there is a surplus of live animals on the market. And so um, when, uh, you know, when that happens, there's decreased production capacity. And so the, the output of cuts of beef is limited. And so the demand increases, prices increase, but farmers don't see any, any of that. Their farmers are hurting because they have animals they can't sell. So you can go to the next slide and I'll try to speed this up because I know I have limited time. But so what we do at UK to alleviate all that in between is to try to shorten that supply chain and buy as close to the farmer as we can. And so we have a whole animal program uh, at UK for beef and pork, both. Um, but we do this because when we have a meal service that uses 500 pounds of brisket, well, you know, you can, you guys know as producers that that's, you know, tens of thousands of other, you know, pounds of other cuts that is not sold when that brisket is sold. And so that all those other cuts end up in inventory somewhere, which is a huge liability. As you all know, if you're selling direct to consumer, you have to really manage that tightly or else it gets out of control very fast. And so my responsibility as a big buyer is to help eliminate that risk of inventory and so we commit to buy the whole animal and um, we work with an aggregator a processor marksbury farm market is who our partner is right now on this program and they pool the local farmers together and they process it to our specifications um, and it's 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 custom program for us we do this we we buy every week we buy four beeves um, cut to our specifications. And so, um, you know, we have, we have altered our menus to um, fit in with what we're getting on a weekly basis. And so on our normal menu, we would never have beef shanks, for example, but we have changed everything around so that we can accommodate all of the product coming in. And so this is just a slide of how the program works. Um, farmers deliver to the aggregator, in this case it's Marksbury, based on, you know, like our weekly commitment, which is four beeves per week. Um, and then Marksbury processes it, packs it, and sends it to our distributor. Our distributor then um, breaks it up into the different orders to go to each one of our dining locations on campus. And then our chefs are serving and creating menus around those weekly deliveries so that the students and the eaters on campus are eating fresh beef every week using local beef and they're getting like the creativity of, of those menu options. And so over the course of the school year, which is from August until May, we purchase 128 beeves and for pork is 192 hogs in total. And so this opens up, this builds up the local food infrastructure, which is what the end goal is here. Um, and so by bringing in the aggregator and the distributor into this mix, they have other customers that they're working with too. And so they, there's a, a larger market available to every farmer that uh, is feeding into the UK program. Um, and that's just an overview of what we do. Um, you know, it, it accomplishes so many different things for uh, us as the buyer. We have been able to secure a lower price by buying the whole carcass. We can get the fresh product and we know that we're getting the consistency from each week. It's a lot easier to plan because if we were just buying a la carte, there would be no guarantee that there would be local brisket available if we needed that on a weekly basis. So um, this work is a win-win for everybody. And, um, you know, I just want to plug that if all institutions of this size purchased in this way, it would really stimulate that local market and could, you know, be an anchor in communities for the local, the local beef um, that, uh, 
can support, you know, other channels, farmers markets and direct to consumer, things like that. So I will pass it back to Olivia, but I'm happy to answer any questions um, when it's time. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, yes, if people have questions, just go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. I've got a couple that we've already um, come up with, but with that, I'm gonna move on to Rita. And I've got a slide for you here if you just wanna talk a little bit about um, the way that you've used local beef. Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Rita Michael. I have um, seven restaurants and a bakery currently and an events business. And obviously over the past quarter, we haven't used as much beef as we normally do, but um, we're, we're actually, at, at, after a, a lot of years of trying, uh, very close to a whole animal program ourselves, which makes me very happy. Um, we use a lot of ground beef because all of the hamburgers that we sell at all the restaurants are locally produced. Um, our primary beef um, supplier right now is Patrick Kennedy out of Stonecross Farms. And he also does all of our pork. And that relationship has just grown up over 20 years of doing business together. Um, so I think uh, we sold about 100,000 burgers last year. Maybe, maybe we're up closer to 125,000 for, for 2019. And then we also use a lot of ground beef in our chili um, and in meatloaf. So that's for the casual restaurant side, both at Wallace Station, Windy Corner, Zim's. They're big chili um, consumers. And, um, and, and once a week, everybody does a meatloaf. So we do go through a lot of ground beef. We have just started a corned beef program um, with Patrick to do locally cured corned beef for the Reuben sandwiches at Zim's. And then if we can get into a cycle with that, we could move that corned beef over to Wallace and Wendy as well. Um, Honeywood and Holly Hill Inn use primarily steak cuts, although we do a lot of braising. And this goes back to the recipe um, development that Allison was talking about. One of the things that I really encourage you to market is the boneless chuck roast. Um, we have had pot roast on the menu at Honeywood from the day we opened that restaurant, primarily to help with the braising cuts. Um, I love pot roast. I grew up eating pot roast. I love short ribs of beef. I love braised beef and it can work very, very well in restaurant setting. Um, and it gives a, a more economical beef on uh, menu item. And um, I just, I encourage everybody to to think about those braising cuts. Um, uh, but most, almost all of the beef that we serve, whether it's a steak or I would say 80% of the beef that we serve, um, whether it's a steak or a hamburger or a pot roast is locally produced um, and purchased um, from a Kentucky cattleman, which makes me very happy. Uh, I, I, um, I, In terms of our beef, in terms of our beef, how our beef works, it you know it, it's definitely uh, improved over the years and become very efficient for us to work with one base, basic aggregator um, in Patrick, who um, supplies and delivers all the beef to all the restaurants each week. We do use a commissary kitchen at Fazek Tipton where we produce all of our chili and then we because we can flash cool it and then we can cryovac it. Um, and that kind of thing. But otherwise, each restaurant takes delivery of their own burgers. We use a third pound patty. And, um, and then he delivers steaks to Holly Hill Inn and to Zim's. We've used a lot of wonderful beef producers in the past. Um, but and I don't think, I think it's better, it's easier now to get for restaurants to, um, it's easier than it ever has been in my career for restaurants to find local beef producers. And I have many, many people who contact me every year. And although I would love to be able to do business with everybody, I know Patrick really, you know, I have to be, I'm very loyal to my producer because I, I can't be the disruptor in the supply chain, just like what Carolyn said, I need to live up to the commitment that I've made to him um, so that we can keep things moving in a very smooth and even way. Um, it's been a crazy quarter. I know that um, restaurants, um, I know the demand is way down and um, 
I do feel like in our business, we're at about 50% of our normal sales that, that we are where we have been, but we are still open and we are getting, we're increasing what we're doing every day. And uh, I do feel like in Kentucky, if we could make it through this, we could make it through anything. <laughs> and I think we're doing a good job of making it through. So I am uh, proud to be able to continue to purchase um, all that I can from Patrick and and uh, you know, very proud to be able to be in relationship with so many great Kentucky farmers. Thank you, Lita. Um, and yeah, it just goes probably goes without saying. Um, you showed a lot of leadership at the beginning of the COVID outbreak, and um, I know I appreciate that. We a lot of us appreciate that. So, and thank you just for taking the time to to talk to us tonight. Um, we will have a time of questions in a minute, but before that, we're going to cover um, the Kentucky Cattlemen's ground beef. Caitlin? Yes. So in the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association building, we do have multiple entities that are housed in that office. One of those being Beef Solutions, which is the parent company of Kentucky Cattlemen's ground beef. In late 2016, early 2017, KCA, um, most notably Dave Maples and Allison Smith, were approached by Kroger with an opportunity to provide a local Kentucky ground beef to their retail shelves. They saw this demand coming from their consumers. The consumers wanted it. Um, there was a lot of conversations around it, but being such a large company, they didn't have the time and attention and the resources to produce a product like that. So they came to our office um, and our staff as Allison Smith has worked at Kroger for a number of years and done a phenomenal job that they trusted Kentucky's beef industry to provide a product like this to their customers. In 2018, Beef Solutions officially launched um, Kentucky Cattlemen's Ground Beef in Kroger stores across Kentucky and Southern Indiana uh, and Illinois, a few select stores in Illinois and Indiana. We have two products currently in retail, three products actually, excuse me, currently in retail there. Um, when we launched, we launched with our one pound ground beef package, which is that package that's on the left hand side of your screen. And we launched with a two pound, four eight ounce patty pack of patties um, on the retail shelves. In April of 2019, we changed from a two pound, four patty package to a one pound, two patty package that put both of those products at the same retail price um, and also made it more consumer friendly. We found that through comments, both on our social media channels and in our website and feedback from Kroger that that was really a more manageable package size for your average consumer that was purchasing products like this. We do currently, um, have a lot of opportunities within Kroger to source products to the consumers in four different states, as well as an opportunity to recently, um, at the start of COVID, put product into the service counter. So you can walk up to that service counter in Kroger, ask for Kentucky Cattlemen's Ground Beef patties and buy one at a time, buy five at a time. So it's really been a great opportunity to be able to provide more packaged pounds through this. As we see here in, um, even in the retail world and with Cattlemen's Ground Beef and being able to produce a larger volume, we have to get creative on some of our marketing opportunities. Um, our labeling claims are local and natural. So natural being the USDA definition of minimally processed, no additives, preservatives. And with our local component, we do, um, in our enrollment process for the cows require that those cows have been on a Kentucky farm for a minimum of 60 days. So part of our marketing opportunities are being able to help educate the consumer around our labeling claims and just the sheer number of cattle in the state of Kentucky and cattle men and, and women in the state of Kentucky and also shine a light on the fact that those cows are staying here and the production practice is staying here within the state Producers provide records to us for those cows to be enrolled in the program. 
we have to get creative in a lot of our marketing opportunities. We're working on a budget as well, um, as I'm sure all of you are, and we use a lot of digital and social media efforts in those marketings. So here you see some of the examples with that local beef recipes and local beef supporting local farmers of some of the digital ads that we've placed on different websites, um, used even on our social media. You see there where we celebrated our two years and we had our graphic back in March of 2020. One of the things I will encourage a lot of you to do is to, in looking at your social media platforms, if you have those, and even on your websites, and seeing opportunities to where you can share your story through some of the pictures. You don't all the time have to have some of the fancy equipment, things like that. Those iPhone cameras these days, or even those Samsung cameras these days, do a great job of capturing some of those product photos. We're very fortunate to have some talented um, staff members in the KCA office that can code their time to beef solutions that are graphic designers and photographers. But a lot of times they're pulling out their iPhones as well to snap some of those social media posts. And I know Anna Hawkins, who's on the checkoff side, she uses a lot of her, her cell phone for some stuff like that. So don't be afraid to post those and really use those digital assets to your benefit when marketing your beef. Um, we have the opportunity with Kentucky Cattlemen's Ground Beef to provide a great impact across the state. We love sharing the opportunity with consumers, Kroger representatives, um, new opportunities when, when we talked and were, were having initial conversations with KFC Yum Center to put some product in there, really about the impact that Kentucky Cattlemen's has across the state of Kentucky by working with numerous farms. So as of the end of June, 2020, we've actually pulled cows off of 161 farms across the state of Kentucky, which is phenomenal. It's been a wonderful opportunity to be able to work with such a diversified background of farms. Some of those farms and farmers have sold one cow to beef solutions. Some of them have sold 20 cows to beef solutions. One of the great things that I truly think with this program is the fact that we will have weeks where Maybe it's four farms that are providing cattle to us. Maybe it's one week we had 14 different farms providing cattle to us. We purchase cows based off of our POs. That way we're really honing in and being very cognizant of one inventory that's going to the freezer, but also food waste opportunity to where we wanna make sure we're maximizing the supply chain itself. We, through the process of purchasing, cows from farmers, which we purchase based on hot carcass weight. So we're purchasing that carcass itself. We've put $1.5 million back into Kentucky farms. So that farm gate sales is actually the total dollar amount that we've paid farmers for their cows. Um, we get really excited around these numbers and, and it's been a wonderful opportunity to see them grow and expand and really have conversations around how can we even increase that footprint and what opportunities are there to package more pounds of Kentucky Cattlemen's Ground Beef and ultimately put a greater impact on the state of Kentucky. With our supply chain, like I said, we purchase from cattlemen and women themselves based on hot carcass weight. So those farmers deliver those cows to our supply chain partner for slaughter, which currently is Marksbury Farm in Lancaster. And then that product, after it has become a carcass and gets boned out into beef trim, gets transported to Creation Gardens in Louisville where they grind, package, and distribute Kentucky Cattlemen's ground beef into the Kroger Distribution Center, um, which is conveniently across the street from them. So that, that's very nice geographically. But also they distribute and package our product for KFC Yum Center. Um, we had some product into the St. Xavier Assumption and Trinity High Schools last year, and, and we look forward to new opportunities. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, we're going to go to some Q&A, which Spencer is going to uh, moderate between, between the three of you. All right. Uh, I'm going to start off with one that came in on the Q&A panel. Uh, Carolyn, this is probably more directed for you. Um, do you know of any other colleges or large companies in the state that are doing a program similar to you all? Um, so I, none exactly like this. The reason why ours is so unique is that we are not grinding the whole carcass, which is often what happens in a whole animal program. It, you know, is all ground, but in food service, um, 
we wanted to maintain as much of the cuts as, as possible. And so with the volume that we're looking at and the, the way that we receive product, this is a pretty unique structure to the program, but um, it's designed in a way to be sustainable for both the farmer, the processor and us um, in the kitchen. Um, and so I see the question, um, other large companies and other colleges, that's part of my, you know, goal in Aramark supply chain is to scale what we're doing here into these other colleges and companies. Um, you know, a lot of the food service that happens in higher education, in K through 12, in um, corporate dining is through food service companies like Aramark. And so my end goal is to better connect the, you know, that sort of corporate mentality of menu planning with like what actually happens on the farm. And, um, you know, if those can connect a little more, then they, these types of programs hopefully become more commonplace um, because really, I truly think it's like the responsibility of companies like Aramark to purchase in this type of fashion so that we can have the biggest um, impact on the, com the economy in which in the area that we're operating in. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, one question, uh, this could be for anybody that wants to answer it, I guess. Uh, what can the farmer do that would make your all's job easier? I have, I have a little bit of advice when you're trying to sell to restaurants or even to Aramark. I mean, I, their purchasing streams are a little bit more complicated to get into, but any kind of, um, when you're dealing with a company like mine of any size where we're reselling the beef, um, we use what we call, and I, I encourage farmers to understand how chefs calculate food cost and what restaurants use as a guide for profitability in terms of what we call our prime cost, which is the, the sum of your food cost and your labor cost. And those are the numbers we track every single week along with our sales. Um, but we really, one of the things I wanted to bring up and forgot to was like, I think the thing that's the most marketable on our menus in restaurants is beef, not just ground beef, but all cuts of beef. I feel it re they beef really does drive business. Um, and the story of, um, that uh, the farming story of the individual producer really drives in my restaurants because this is a big marketing tool for us is Kentucky Proud. It drives sales. So I know there were a lot of marketing terms that Allison was talking about earlier. One of the ones that we've used for our hamburgers because we didn't want to confuse the consumer with a whole bunch of different terms. And, you know, I got an education from several cattlemen that said, you know, when you have a sick animal out in the yard, out, in the, out on the farm in the field, and they have pink eye or have something like that, we need to be able to treat that animal and administer some antibiotics. And in that situation, antibiotics can be a very good thing. So why do I want to handicap the farmer from, from treating their animal the very best that they can out in, the, out in the field? So I got a big education myself over the years on how animals are cared for and raised um, by our cattlemen. So we just used, we use we use Kentucky Proud as our moniker and raised by Kentucky farming families. I think that's the most important priority for me as a consumer, as a wholesale consumer. And I think it's the most important priority for the people who are buying um, our, our clients who want to buy Kentucky beef and support the Kentucky farmer. So uh, one of the things to think about with beef, though, in terms of the food cost is whatever the pound uh, price is, we do a yield test on that. So if we, we tend to buy ours in primals, and then like on a New York, on a strip loin primal cut, we're gonna lose the ends because we can't serve the vein ends as steaks. We're gonna cut the steaks and then calculate a per steak cost. That steak cost needs to be about 30% or 33%, maybe 35. You know, I take it as high as I can go in terms of the food cost percentage of the final menu price. So when you're pricing your, um, when you're pricing your different cuts, create a zone of pricing. I think I deal with, I haven't dealt with a lot of li livestock farmers lately because Patrick and I have a long standing relationship, but I have a lot of farmers have a hard time calculating what they should charge when they want to go 
into a wholesale business or into a retail business. Um, and they're, and you know, I don't know exactly what all the costs are going into an animal, but I would assume that farmers do the same thing that I do when I'm calculating a menu price. I'm looking at all my costs, labor and ingredient to go into that menu price. So I, I think, you know, know your market, keep your marketing clean, simple, and then know your pricing. Those are the things that I encourage farmers to do uh, to, to, to make the chef's job easier anyway. Thank you, Wida. Uh, anybody else? Um, I'll just add to uh, what Awida said and stress that, you know, you, you, the farmer is the expert in farming, in the product itself. And so, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, you can rely on other pieces to get your product to market. If you're not interested in di selling direct to consumer, if marketing is not your strong suit, don't try to put yourself in that box. Focus on making the best product and um, integrating into other areas to be able to sell your product. So don't be scared to talk to distributors. Don't be scared to talk to, you know, processors um, that might you know, require you to sell it at a lower price, but maybe you could sell more of it. So, you know, I guess, you know, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of talk of direct marketing, which is like such a great resource for farmers, but don't feel stressed like you have to become this all-inclusive business person all of a sudden on every aspect here. Um, and that's where, you know, hopefully, the buyers and we can stimulate more buyers to buy locally so that you don't have to market every cut of meat directly to your farm. Um, so I just want to put that out there in case the concept of marketing stresses you all out as it does for me. Uh, Olivia, you think we got time for one more quick question? Yeah, we'll do one more. Um, we'll just try to keep it quick. Okay. Um, Last question that I'll ask uh, on behalf of everybody would be, uh, what's the most challenging aspect of buying local beef? What your experience has been? I think in the past, the most challenging aspect is most restaurants buy from large broad, uh, broad line retailers and you buy online, you can use your phone. Um, I was gonna try to show you the Creation Garden app on my phone, but I decided I shouldn't be playing with my phone. But it's got to the point where you can actually have the Creation Garden has an app that downloads to chef's phones. They punch their order in on the phone and the next day the food comes. So everything is done um, digitally. And so sometimes one of, from, a, from a chef's perspective, one of the most challenging aspects of buying local beef could be just that contact, that point of contact. And in the past, what I've recommended um, for farmers is that they set a day for ordering and a set a day for delivering. If that's what they're going to do, if they want to get into sort of a wholesale market like a restaurant market. Um, but I think that's, that's the main, that's the major challenge. And I'll tell you what, it's gotten easier and easier and easier. There are a lot of, um, a lot of broadline distributors who are selling more and more uh, local beef. Creation Garden is one of those. Um, and I just want to encourage people to try to get into some of those supply chains. It can really make your life a lot easier. But that, that to me is the number one. Otherwise, it's gotten much better. I would say, and I'm kind of in a little bit of a unique position here because we're when talking about like buying beef, technically beef solutions and cattlemen's ground beef, we're buying the carcass um, and not necessarily just an individualized cut. But I think one of the challenges and it's kind of an overarching theme throughout tonight is bridging the gap between communication and education and understanding really what's happening within the supply chain versus what's happening on the farm and how to communicate the needs of the farmer, the needs of the end user, the consumer, or that intermediate, whether it be a chef or distributor, to really the reality of what can happen within a supply chain. And I think that's not even uncommon within direct-to-market opportunities. If you're selling direct-to-consumer on your farm and 
consumers are going to have some questions about your supply chain opportunities and, and what it's like to process an animal. And I think it's wonderful to be able to share your story. Carolyn brought up a great point to where if you're a little bit overwhelmed by some of the marketing and things like that, you're going to have to do to be direct to consumer going and finding new avenues like selling direct to a distributor or selling your animal to beef solutions where or another program like that where they're buying the carcass and kind of working with you on both a live and a carcass side still be able and and be excited to share your story because i know that even with us we love to share those farmer stories and marketing opportunities and i think some of the challenging aspects are helping people understand it's okay to to let that story go and let people into what you're doing can i add one thing about an obstacle for uh, people who are in getting into selling local beef it is really important that you cut you develop your cut sheet with the processor um, it took me a long time to get the the cut sheet that worked really well for our company so i know i want all the whole chuck roast i know i want the whole strip loin i know i want the whole you know, ribeye, I know I want the beef tenderloin. I don't want anybody to cut steaks for me. You know, so I, it took a lot of back and forth with that. And I think no matter where you're selling, whether you're selling to me or whether you're selling to um, Caitlin or whether you're sell, selling, getting into the Airmark supply chain or another one that's like that, those are whole carcass uh, sales routes. But if you were selling, especially to the local, to the individual um, consumer, Knowing that cut sheet and really focusing on what you think are the best cuts and doing that research on what to market at, in advance and then working with the processors because be you know honestly processors need to be continuously trained in meat cutting. They have problems with consistency at times and you need to inspect what they're giving you in the box. So like if you're taking your animal to a processor uh, to be uh, cut according to a cut sheet, you need to have the cut sheet with you and you need to be evaluating exactly what they're putting into that cut sheet. And my last piece of advice is that you should sell the beef bones. Beef bones are very valuable in the restaurant industry for stock and I pay 50, you know, I pay, I pay like $150, I mean like $3 a pound for beef bones. So th those were the two things that I was thinking of that I forgot to mention that cut sheets are very important and I use a meat buyer's guide. In chef school, we were trained with the Meat Buyer's Guide. It's a wonderful resource that goes through every retail cut of, of an animal. And just like some of the charts that you saw tonight, but that book is invaluable to me and I use it still every day. And I train all my young chefs on that, that Meat Buyer's Guide. That's great advice. Carolyn, did you wanna um, quickly touch on this or? Um, yeah, I mean, sure. I think I kind of mentioned it in my, um, my talk was, I mean, just with the volume, the sheer volume, um, getting consistency buying a la carte is very hard in the, uh, in this setting. And I mean, I, I can stress also what Alita said. Um, and that's why for like a food service company, for me, my partner needs to be the processor because we do require and need it to be cut in exactly the same way every single time. And so, um, you know, the challenge, you know, on this end would be to build that, those relationships because, you know, I want to be partners with the processor, but I also want direct links to the farmers and so um you know just building those relationships is huge and so i mm -hmm. guess you know if i had to, to close on any piece of advice is and caitlin mentioned also like don't be you know shy to get out there and talk because everyone thinks what you're doing is so cool and so if you can get out there and talk to people as much as possible you can start to build those relationships that are only gonna lead to sales in the end. Great, thank you. Um, just to our audience, I know we've gone a little bit long, but I really wanted to get those questions in. So um, next we're gonna have Chad Smith and um, Wida really gave a great, a great segue into his presentation because he's gonna talk um, about Kentucky Proud and what the um, Office of Agricultural Marketing does. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, it's a lot of fun to be able to participate on the panel with uh, 
a group of true rock stars and talk about a rock star product. So we'll quickly give an overview of the Kentucky Proud program, some of the um, sub programs within that to help load up your toolbox to assist you in marketing. Kentucky Proud is the state's official agricultural marketing program. It's developed by Kentucky statute. Today, we support over 9,500 members covering all 120 counties in the state. We like to say that we're the storytellers and the matchmakers. Um, we're here to market the product. We're here to help expand markets, develop markets. Um, and some of the tools that we have to assist you in doing that um, are our social media accounts. With that, we have 113,000 followers or over 113,000 followers uh, via Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, with that, one of the things I didn't mention in this program, we're also developing certain landing pages amongst the website. So if you want to go out to kyproud.com forward slash beef, you're going to see a list of meat marketers. Um, that are represented by our members and they, uh, that's broken down uh, via county. So uh, good resource out there. But one of the programs that we'll talk about real quickly, um, for those of you that are not already uh, Kentucky Proud members, I encourage you to go online. You can register for the program online. It is no cost. And uh, we have some valuable uh, resources out there, such as what we call our point of purchase program. This is a cost share program that offers reimbursement up to $8,000 annually, $36,000 in a lifetime for marketing and advertising expenses. So if you put out a dollar, we're going to match that dollar up to $8,000 annually. This can go to business cards. It can go to vehicle wraps. It can go to menus. Uh, web development, quite an assortment of things. So with that, some of the items that we are showing, we've got our Crank and Boom ice cream out of uh, Lexington here, and then some of our other um, dairy providers. So uh, a tremendous tool out there for marketing efforts that I encourage you to um, evaluate and take a look at if you are currently marketing your beef and or looking to do so. The other product that, um, although, Within the poll, I see that nobody is currently selling due to the tremendous efforts of WIDA and others within the program. Since the second quarter of 2017, we've been able to show that we've moved over $3.3 million of meats within the program. That's coming directly from Kentucky farmers into our local Kentucky uh, food service and restaurants. While that figure doesn't um, solely denote beef and there are other meats in there meat uh, excuse me beef is a uh, very large uh, component of that so um, buy local again is a tool that helps the local producers uh, beef farmers create relationships with restaurants with other food service entities across the state um, while the producers themselves are not reimbursed. The restaurant is reimbursed 15% on eligible food purchases. So Kentucky beef is something that is reimbursable. Um, it's another tool to have in your belt, if you will, as you're um, trying to make the relationships that we and Carolyn have talked about. Um, sometimes there could be price barriers and hopefully this 15% um, helps overcome some of those. With the program, again, we have our own landing page for the Buy Local program. So we have our lifetime um, uh, awardees uh, that are listed on there. We have our top performers listed. We have all of our participants listed by the city. So if you happen to be out and um, want to be a consumer rather than a producer, I encourage you to visit that site. You can uh, quickly determine who's who's doing it well and uh, where they're doing it uh, across the state. Um, lastly, I think one of the other programs that I wanna mention, although the current pandemic has uh, almost made this impossible because of our attendee requirements, uh, our Farm to Fork program is another tremendous opportunity for nonprofits, community style dinners to um, put some money back 
uh, into the organizers' coffers that can then go to support local um, charitable events. But um, if you're ever involved in those programs, it's a, a good opportunity to talk with the organizers of putting local meats um, on the menu and moving forward. So that is a quick 30,000 foot overview. And I think we almost came in to do it on time, but um, if there's any questions, please reach out, please visit the website, please send an email and we'll take any, uh, any questions that you've got. Thanks. Thank you so much, Chad. Uh, it's a really great program. And I also just wanted to mention that, um, that, that consumer facing page that you've made, oops, sorry. Um, I actually use that in my job some when farmers say I wanna sell to restaurants. Um, I'll pull up and say what restaurants are already buying uh, local products through that buy local program. So if you're if you're a producer who wants to get into the restaurants, you can you can see who is participating in buying local already um, on that website. So I'm going to go through this pretty fast. Um, but one thing I did want to mention is that um, K Card recently received a three-year USDA local food promotion program grant. And um, that is building on the work of several um, people who've been working with local foods for a while now. Um, there have been different local food coordinators in um, Lexington and Louisville who've done a great job. And this program is really just building on this. And so the goal is to connect producers with appropriate buyers. Specifically, we do wanna hone in on um, helping facilitate strong institutional buying relationships and serve as a key hub for the various partners who are involved in the local food work. So um, with that, if, if you are um, a producer who is who's growing or processing a local food item um, and you really need assistance identifying new markets for, for sales growth, um, please reach out to me. I'm, I'm fairly new into this position just a couple months now. I've been with KCARD for, um, a year and a half now, but um, I'm getting my feet wet in this role and I'm looking forward to it. Um, okay, so then Spencer, back to you and you can close us out. All right, thanks Olivia. Um, and I just wanna say thanks to all the presenters tonight for spending their evening with us. Uh, I think we've covered a lot of good information tonight and uh, hopefully everyone uh, learned a little bit and I know I have, so. Uh, this last slide that's up on the screen now has our general K card information on it. It's got our phone number and our email. It also has contact information for Olivia and myself. Well, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Uh, Want to talk about your farm business any further? Um, anything of that nature? We're we're happy to help with a business plan, financial projections, uh, whether you're starting or expanding your business. We're happy to help with that. Uh, and in case you weren't tuned in for the last couple of nights. Uh, just a few things before we close out for the evening. Um, by the end of this week, hopefully by tomorrow, uh, the recordings of tonight's webinar, as well as the last two nights, will be available on the KCARD YouTube channel. And uh, we'll be sending out an email to all the attendees that will contain the link for the YouTube channel with the recorded webinars. It'll also have some various links that we'll discuss in additional detail in some of the topics that were addressed by presenters over the last three nights. And then the last thing that it'll have will be a survey. And that survey will ask for your input on the webinar itself, and also ask if you're interested in follow up by anyone at KCARD or with the Kentucky Beef Council staff members. Uh, and if you say that you are uh, a staff member for one of the organizations or both, whichever one you pick, we'll be in touch with you soon. And uh, so with that, I just wanna say thanks again to the presenters tonight and to all of you who joined in to watch. We appreciate you joining in with us. Uh, we've enjoyed this webinar series, and uh, everyone have a good night. Stay safe and take care.